Okay, in this increment, I'm just going to talk aloud about the rules of Bible Hebrew meter testing. Because I'm sort of at a, in a quandary about one of the rules. I'm certain it's being met, but I'm not certain that I'm calculating it properly. Okay, first of all, one, one of the biggest rules that it's got to follow is that this, and this is where I'm stuck, this section here where the 35, I'll put the black next to it, that is a date line. That it's married at age 35 or the 35th year of Herod, or probably both, makes sense. That's the most important criterion of a time poem. It's got to tell you when it's written. And it makes sense because one of the things that you do is you come full circle. That's another rule. And she's coming full circle in her timeline right here. All right? So that buttresses the interpretation. See, this is the Bible's time poems are self auditing. So you can tell if you make a mistake or if you're getting it right because pieces fit together. So if one piece isn't fitting but should, then you know to go look. Okay, but see this piece here is dating to this piece here, and it can't be a coincidence. All right, it's just a question of whether that 35 only means Herod's rule, because we know that Herod, you know, became tetrarch in 40 BC. All right, remember this is all end of year, so this is end of 40 BC. These are all end of year numbers here, until she switches to beginning of year here. And she does that in order to play 14 and 16, in order to play on Daniel. Um, so I know that the 35 at least references when Herod was Tetrarch. And that's another characteristic of Bible Hebrew meter. When they are giving you a dateline, it's got to be years from something that's significant to Israel. It can be something significant measured in terms of time before Israel if it's benchmarking the time of Israel as a deadline related to that other date. In other words, when Moses wrote Psalm 90, he benchmarked it to the 1050th anniversary of the flood. Okay, well, the flood is the reason why Israel got to be Israel. So it's, it was important. And 1050 in particular is saying that the deadline for Israel to become Israel, for them to enter the land, was no later than 1050 from the flood, which implies another criterion of God's orchestrating time that I haven't been considering. In other words, there are other deadlines than the ones I'm telling you. You know, the 1050s work in other ways as well, but I haven't worked all that out yet. But clearly that's one of them. Okay, that God's schedule was that 10, 50 years after the flood, um, Israel would have to be in the land. And, you know, she's entering the land on the 1051st. In other words, the 1050 completed, now she can enter. That was the deadline. And she meets it, because he's dying that year. All right, that's 1400 B.C. in our terms. Okay, so... The 35 has to reference, at least reference, years from a king. And that's why I say it's her age, because she's carrying Messiah. So really, rightfully, she ought to be dating it by her own age at the time she says it, in order for it to end up being years from a king. And of course, that makes sense also, because she's going to end this with a 56, which Paul uses. All right, so if this is an age... The other requirement is that this also has to tie back to that age, okay? And she is doing that. So Paul picks up at Christ being 56. That's a lot more complicated than that. I mean, this is not the only, the, the only criterion for this dateline. But before I come back to the dateline issue, I want to just briefly recap some of the others. The next thing in the time poem is that it's got to have seven paragraphs with numbers that are doctrinally significant. Okay, 35 is God votes, 
42 is generation, 63 is vote short, 98 stands for millennium, 105 is a play on David's kingship at Hebron versus his kingship at um, his united kingship, this being, you know, the 98 here being a play on David's united kingship. Here it's only, it's only symbolic, okay? Here it's actually playing to literal, which is a long thing to, to explain. And 105 is frequently referenced, and Paul uses it too, um, because the character of uniting all time under Israel, uniting all history under Israel, is the theme of these poems. See, Deuteronomy 32.8, all history is organized around Israel. And so that's what these time poems do, is show you how, you know, like here it was Marius, the rise of Marius. That was the rise of Rome, which seems unrelated, but the text is showing you the relationship. If it wasn't for Marius, Rome wouldn't have had the army needed to come in, you know, under Pompey. And, and take over Israel to prevent her from fracturing herself. And there would have been no Julius Caesar able to get power. He wouldn't have had enough manpower to cross the Rubicon. Because there wouldn't have been enough soldiers because if they had kept the old rules about only nobles can be in the military, then there would have, this would have never happened. Rome would have never become a world power without Marius changing the rules here. So it's rightly that she puts this text with this guy because it's due to him that Israel gets rescued by Rome and one of the chief characteristics of Caesar is that he was very pro-Israel. He was very elegant to Israel. Okay, When he takes power, this is part of this crossing the Rubicon. After he crosses the Rubicon, he becomes dictator in 48. And then he does a swing through, um, the you know through Egypt and and Israel, and that was when you know Antipater got involved with the weak guy who was Hyrcanus II, and they aided Caesar in beating Pompey's forces, because you know Pompey had made the disastrous mistake of of going you know eastward, all right, and that's how come Caesar was able to take you know to take advantage of it. Because at that point, Caesar was closer to Rome than Pompey, as far as the troops were concerned. All right, and that's why there could be so many troops because this is a guy who changed the who could be in the military. See how all these pieces fit together, and they fit together to defend Israel. That's the theme of history. That's the whole reason why these time poems. One of the requirements is that the the poem has this kind of text that seems generic. But the meter underneath it is telling you what history this text relates to. History that, for the most part, is, is outside or peripheral to or tangential to Israel's own, but serves to preserve her. That's the whole purpose of these time poems, is to explain that. All right? And so one of the things you test for is whether the meter actually ties to specific really important dates in history that affect Israel's history. And these all do. Okay? They, they really do. And so, you know, and the same thing was true in Daniel. The same thing was true in Isaiah. And even though Daniel and Isaiah restricted their timelines to Israel's kings alone, Israel's king's behavior was due to their perception and their interaction with the world around them. Okay, and the world around them in turn was impacted because Israel's in the center of three continents. You know, I mean, that's the whole point of Daniel 11, is showing the westward movement of history. The king of the north is progressively western, ending with Rome. It's still north of Israel, but it's northwest then. Okay, and that's what she's, she's showing how Daniel 11 is fulfilled. And in fact, if you were to take this period right here, when Caesar swings down through the Middle East, after he crosses the Rubicon, becomes dictator, okay, 
until really just the year before he's murdered or even the year that he's murdered um that whole play that whole the whole series of movements that he did he did and the interaction with him and Israel helping him that is exactly the kind of pattern that Daniel 11 predicts okay in other words Daniel 11 is telling you hi history is going to repeat itself and that's why it's really hard to tell one king of the north from the next in the wording that the angel gives because he's always saying he he's, he's setting up parallels between one ruler after the next ruler after the next ruler north and progressively west of Israel is going to have the same goal going to do the same thing but it doesn't turn out the same way each time so it changes the ending okay and there's always in that story which is unfortunately missed in modern theology. There's always in that story a tale of two antichrists, not one. One of them is in Israel, and one of them is, you know, north or northwest. And like during the time of Antiochus, the guy playing the role of the antichrist in, in Israel are the Maccabees. That's not getting enough attention. The Maccabees are being, you know, how do we want to call it? Um, praised. They shouldn't be praised. They are a model of the Antichrist. That's the point of Daniel 11. Daniel 11 is first tying to Antiochus IV. So it's specifically talking about the Maccabees. Alright? They rise, you know, against him. There were others who were, you know, cooperating with him at that time. But the Maccabees then assumed the role of the the antichrist the jewish antichrist because they usurp okay they usurp the authority of the house of aaron and the houses of david which we saw um and mary's referencing that right up here in maccabees 10 1 in verse 21 because jonathan is bribed by demetrius Okay, and by Alexander, Alexander um, representing the um, son of Antiochus, and Demetrius is a, a son of Ptolemy's, you know, the two different groups. And they both bribe the Jews into going along with them to try to fight with each other. Demetrius and Alexander are at war with each other. And, and I forget if it's Demetrius or um, Alexander, I think it's, um, I think it's Alexander who bribes Jonathan into, into being high priest and taking the purple. I mean, you can look it up in there, I, you know, you'll see which name it is. Okay? That's the usurping. They're the Antichrist at that point. They're the Jewish Antichrist at that point. And that same trend continues at the end of history as well. And that's what Revelation 13 is talking about. The Jewish Antichrist is the false prophet for the king of the north, who's now the king of the west, Rome, revived. In other words, what Caesar did is, this, is the same procedure as what Antiochus did. And between the two of them, you had other, you know, kings of the north, Greek rulers in that, in that, in that time, who were playing footsie with Israel, and there were plenty of people in Israel, in this case it was the Maccabees themselves, who were willing to play Antichrist, Jewish Antichrist. You know, so, so history repeats itself. Daniel 11 is going to play again, same format, same pattern as here and here. Okay? And you're always going to have somebody playing like a Harkanus. And the really sad thing is that the Jews are going to think that the Maccabees are heroes. They're going to think back to those days. They're going to misinterpret God saving Israel despite their apostasy, Revelation 11. They're going to rebuild the temple thinking that God is you know, favoring them. And unfortunately, too many Christians are reading Revelation 11. You know, they're, they're, they're misreading Ezekiel 37. They're misreading... Um, Revelation 11 to think that the Jews will be back in God's favor and that's why the temple can be rebuilt. They're not paying enough attention to God's conditions. God says, I will regather you. Not you will regather yourselves. You don't go to Egypt for help, but they do. See, all these regatherings, 
All these savings occur due to political machination by the Maccabees with, you know, playing off the two sides, the King of the North and the King of the South. This is wrong. What they did is wrong. Okay? Yeah, God saved the temple because all the, the choice was, you know, Judas Maccabeus himself was okay. He didn't usurp the priesthood. Mattathias didn't usurp the priesthood. It was Jonathan who did that after Judas died. Okay, so it wasn't the initial generation that did it. It was the brother of, of the, you know, the son of Mattathias who did it. And of course, Simon picked up the ball from there. And that's Hyrcanus was Simon's son. So you see, this whole pattern here is going to play again at the end of time. And we know exactly how it's going to play. From the way Caesar did it. History repeats itself. And the Jews are going to mistake. You know, they're going to think, well, if we, if, we, if we win in a war, we side with the right Gentiles, then God is with us. And he won't be. And that's why in Revelation 11, the two witnesses are clothed in sackcloth. If the temple was the right temple, if the temple was what God wanted, they wouldn't be clothed in sackcloth, having the power to keep everybody away from the temple. Sackcloth is mourning. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. They're mourning for a dead temple. So the one that's up there is as if it's not there. And that's why God says in Revelation 11, use a reed to measure. Okay, well, the only way you can use to read the measure is if you, if you write it down. An angel measures the temple in Ezekiel 39 or 40. I forget which of those two chapters it is. Not a human being. And God doesn't say to an angel, measure the temple in Revelation 11. So it's not the temple that God wants. And they're going to mistake it. And millions of Jews are going to die because of that. And here we go. Here's your pattern. If you want to know how the tribulation is going to, hurt, go, going to occur, just look back in history at this time. Just like Daniel 11 tells you to do. Okay? And by the way, you measure Daniel 12, 1335 days and 1290 days. You measure it backwards. You measure it backwards from the end of the tribulation. So you count, you make seven solar years, count the number of days in seven solar years, count them backwards, and your first exit window is going to be 1,335 days before the end. It's about, it allows about 45 days of exit before the abomination of desolation is put up. And I cover that in my um, tribulational timeline in my Animeter um, video series, first one or second one, something like that. So, this is another big characteristic. In fact, it's a defining one. Does Mary go through real history that's relevant to the time she's measuring? And, of course, she has to tell you when that is. Okay. Logically, it should be Hanukkah. We just saw from the last episode that she's keying off Daniel's, Daniel 9.5's 73 years. Because 73 years from his end point in Daniel 9.19 is Hanukkah, 164 B.C. Now, she's also doing the same thing here. All right? But before I get to that, I still got to go through the other, the other criteria. Okay, I told you that she's got to do seven paragraphs that are doctrinally significant. She passed that test. Now, this text passes that test. Especially here, because this is Isaiah. 133 time to Manasseh, just like Daniel did. This is something Luke does, and I haven't figured out why he does it that way. But what he's doing is he's bifurcating the 84 syllables that are here, which is another characteristic of Bible time poems. Each one has to play off all, not just one, all of the previous time poems. Okay? By using 35, she's obviously playing symbolically off Isaiah. Same thing with 42. 
And the same thing with Psalm 90. She's playing off both of them. She's like saying, hi, I'm playing off both of them. In fact, I'm playing off them so much, I'm going to use the 35 as a date line. Okay, so she passes that test for the date line there. She's passing it here because that's a prominent number in Isaiah. It's also prominent in Psalm 90. Um, and it's not prominent in Daniel. Okay, it's it's alluded to in Daniel, but it's not it's not a specific syllable um, count. And you know this is is the end point that they all have to measure to the millennium. So she passes that. She's touching to the end point and to the doctrinal significance. This is this is the same place that Daniel keys off uh, of Isaiah. She's doing the same thing. This is also prominent. Um, count in um, Psalm 90 and I you know these footnotes document where okay so if you go like here you know I'm telling you where you can find it okay I'm explaining you know in more detail what I'm telling you right here and so that brings us to the end and that's the next characteristic is that first of all the end of the time poem has to um, has to tie to, has to be divisible by 7. And this threw me in the beginning when I started this Magnificat series because I counted the syllables wrong. And like I said, these time poems are so complicated, they're self-auditing. When you make a mistake, if I made a mistake here, which I had initially, then something back up here will prove it a mistake and that's exactly what happened. Okay? I realized that, that I have to read it separately I forgot that then Mary said isn't going to be part of Mary's own words. So then I recognized that I was supposed to check the meter on the right hand side irrespective of, irrespective of Luke. And I, I don't know that I can say that Luke's actually playing on her or not. I have to test that. I haven't done that yet. Okay, then the next characteristic of a time poem and one of these days I'm going to put summarize all this in writing in a web page. The next characteristic of a time poem is it's got to be palindromic, which means that sections, substantial sections of it, have got to come full circle and read backwards and forwards the same way. So this 7 and 21 is 28, housed between a 35 and a 35. Okay? Or you can say it's 42, 21, 42. Okay, well you can read that either one of those backwards or forwards and they'll be the same the same values. Okay? 28 between 235. So you read it 35 28 35 or from where it's in black backwards. So it reads the same way. The numbers are the same. And then this is a 35. All right. So then that stands for 70. Paul plays on these same numbers. But you got here, you got a 42, 28, and this really is 84, not 242s. But Luke breaks them into 242s, I don't know why. So if that were valid, it'd be 42. All right? And you can even parse them that way if you want to. So then you still have the palindrome, you see. And each, no, each one of these numbers, or in combination even, is doctrinally significant. So that the palindromic test is passed here. In other words, I know I parse the syllables right because I'm getting a palindrome. And every single one of the Bible time poems has a palindrome. So, you know, then the question is, you know, did we pass the history test? Yeah, we do. Did we pass the doctrinally significant sevening test? Yeah, we do. Okay, did we tap? pass the tagging of past time poems test, yes we do. Even here in the 47 that's tagging Daniel. Okay. Um, and then she's passing it here but this is very hard to explain and I haven't finished it yet. Okay. So the other thing of course is that the text has to tie to the historical period that she's referencing with wry wordplay. That's true in Psalm 90, that's true, it's especially true in Isaiah, especially true in Daniel, although it's really hard to tell because the sentences sound so much alike. Um, 
it's true, obviously, I've gone through this now so you can see it in Mary, line by line, okay, section by section. I explained how each one of these phrases is, is why, okay, okay, upon the event that's, that's covered. And I could say a lot more about it. You never can finish saying enough about scripture. Um, so she's passing the text tie test. You know, we saw how the text tie test, or we're seeing how the text tie test is working so satirically in Paul. Because he's outlining future church history that we now know, and it's awesome. I mean, even down to the, to the letter of Telematos, he ties it to three different Caesars who in that very year of that very syllable make wills for the next Caesar, who, and the next Caesar undoes the purpose of the deceased Caesar. Okay? It's awesome how that worked. That's how close this can get. Of course, you expect Paul to be that funny with it, but you don't expect Mary to know, at least I didn't, okay? Maybe I'm being prejudiced, but I just didn't expect a woman to be this good with scripture, okay? So, whatever. But, so we got a text tie, we got a history tie, it's annual, because that's the next thing that all the time poems have in common, and then, you know, building on the previous one. She's got to pick up where the latest one left off, latest one being Daniel, as far as I know. And she's picking up at Daniel 73, which we saw. Hopefully you remember that. Because I had so much trouble proving the 73, because I had all that trouble with the fonts. Okay? Now, where I'm having... Tr okay, so that that's kind of it. Oh, the next thing I should tell you is that all these breaks that I'm using... They have to be syntactical breaks. The sevens have to be at syntactical units. Okay, and I went through that in some detail because at first I thought this wasn't correct until I remembered the Hebraistic use of God sees. Okay, and how it can be our humiliation and how you could do this as a chorus. That's another characteristic of time poems that you've got to be, they're anthems. You've got to be able to um, read them like different actors coming on stage saying lines and, or different choruses responding to each other. And Mary passed that test here, especially at the seven sections. That's where, you know, one um, actor goes off the stage, okay, in here. Okay, another actor coming on. Or you could regard this as one whole syntactical unit. And I explained how that worked. That's with the yellow and then the boxing, see this is a box, shows that, hi, this is really a syntactical unit. Here's another syntactical unit. The same is true for these individual paragraphs. Okay, you don't just break them in the middle of, a, of any old syllable. They have to be at a syntactical ending. That has to be a phrase. Doesn't have to be the end of the sentence, but it does have to be a phrase because in a poem, you know, you, you break off in phrases. Okay? especially in Hebrew poetry, all right? It doesn't function like Greek, Greek, you know, poetry. Greek poetry sometimes breaks right in the middle of a syllable, right in the middle of a word, okay? And that's an unfortunate characteristic of modern recitations of uh, Hebrew Bible today. They break off right in the middle of a word if they want to. That's not proper. That's not proper, okay? So it's breaking, the phrase is breaking. Okay, so that's another characteristic. All right, what else have I said? Oh, when you have a complete unit like this to start a new paragraph, all right, the, it, it's not a hard and fast rule, but generally speaking, there's some kind of um, equality, near equality of the syllables, not always. Okay, like this is ending at syllable 105, and this is 217. Okay, so it's not 210, it's an extra 7. But that extra 7 is doctrinally significant, you know, because that's the leftover 7. So it would be equal, except if you wanted to make a point about the extra 7, which she does. Okay, um, what else? Okay, so... 
the last thing, and in a way it's the most important, is proving the dateline. The dateline itself is extremely complicated. Let me illustrate by hers. Okay, we talked about 35 being her age, or 35th year of Herod's kingship, or, you know, Tetrarch kingship. It's still when he started to rule, no matter what you called him. Because remember, the Bible likes to start at beginnings. And I said, you know, this has got to be also her age, 35, whether or not it is. I mean, you know, it's it makes sense. Um, but that's not the only way you prove it. I mean, remember when we started with Daniel? Daniel's date, first date line was 49, referencing 49 years down from Temple Down, because the Temple had its own timeline. And that he was also 73 sevens from 1050 B.C., where Moses left off. So he's tagging Moses, and he tags Isaiah, you know, throughout the rest of his um, epistle. He doesn't have to tag all of them in the same place. In other words, she doesn't have to tag all the other writers in just one section here. But the tagging has to work if you're going to have two datelines especially. One of them, at least one of them, has to be a time 7. So it's either got to be 35 times 7 or 42 times 7 if this is her second date line, which it, it looks like it is. Okay? And then, as if that weren't difficult enough, the thing that your date line has got to be an ellipsis, okay, from your end point in one way or another. Okay, it, it can be an ellipsis as number of years, or it can be an ellipsis as uh, that number, like here, 35 times 7. And the kind of alighting that you do and the kind of measure that you do can be from the end point, i.e. the millennium, which is what the other time poems did, is they, they measure from the millennium. Their totals are measured from millennium. Um, but she's got to do something that that's that's a, a seven. If this is this are both date lines, one of them at least, you know, because Daniel used forty nine, which is seven sevens. You see how he did that? It's not just a number of years; it's a number of sevens. So Daniel qualified on the forty nine alone, even if he didn't use seventy three sevens, because set forty nine is seven sevens. Well, thirty five. Is five sevens, and you could say, okay, well, that's all we need in Mary. Okay, but what if it's 35 sevens? All right, that's something you got to test because all these things convey doctrine. Okay, the other thing is, is that if she's using 35 here, she's got to add it back here because 217 already includes it. So it need, it's an ellipsis, and it's got to add back to something important to show the end of time. How her, how her meter ties to the end of time, because she's reconciling. She's reconciling to the past by using this. She also has to reconcile to the future using that. That's what all the rest of them do. Remember when we went through Daniel? Daniel 9.19 should have ended at 49 instead of 47. But because Israel was going to be short, he either had to end it with a 54 or he had to end it with a, 50, a, a 49. But instead he leaves 56 in ellipsis because he put the extra 7 in the middle at Daniel 9.13 when he ended his total syllable count at 434, which is why God granted 62 weeks so that after Christ was born he could have lived to be age 40 and that would have used up the 62nd week of history which was equal to the extra 7 years that elapsed on the 49 missed sabbatical years, then history would have been made up and you'd only have the 1-7 of the tribulation plus the 50 years that's left out of the Daniel 9 count because it was already known as Jubilee. The 50 years plus the 7 years in order to make up the Abrahamic 54. Okay, so where's Mary doing that? Well, she actually is. And I think at this point I've confused you enough, and we'll cover that in the next increment. But we're focusing now on the remaining big criterion of a time poem, is that it has to use ellipsis after its ending, 
It's ending, of course, being divisible by 7, including the ellipsis, with and without it. And the, third, the, the number, or the number times 7, especially if you have a second date line, all of these have to balance equidistantly as well. See, 217 plus 35 is how she's got to end it, with the 35 not being mentioned. That's got to be equidistant to something, even as this is equidistant to something. Okay, even as her meter was, you know, talking back to the 73 in Daniel 9, 5. Okay, and this has got to be, if this is a second timeline, it's, it too has to be equidistant to something, and it's going to have to tag on here. Otherwise, I got a mistake. So I hope you're beginning to see if you're not totally bleary-eyed already. I hope you're beginning to see that these time poems are self-auditing. If you screw up in your interpretation, you'll get caught. It's like balancing a checkbook. Okay. I really should kill myself or something. The answer was staring me in the face, and I just, I don't know, my brain was out. Okay, to make life simpler, I have highlighted now, in egregious pink, the sections that all tie to each other so I can explain with relative simplicity what Mary's doing. I don't know why I didn't think of this. It wasn't as if God didn't prepare me. So, you know, this is brain out being brain out. You know, when I say something right, God did it. And when I don't say something right, I did it. Simple. Okay, in pink, upper right-hand corner, that's going past the 35. That's what I'm trying to explain. Okay, also in pink, upper right-hand corner for the 42, which unfortunately highlights in black, so you can't read the 42. Okay, so it's this line, only it's the 42 I'm talking about. Those two lines tie to these two lines. God, I am so stupid. Die, tie to this line down here, the 73 in Daniel 9, 5. And tie to this line here in Daniel 9, 19. Conceptually. But they also tie chronologically, but you have to look at a different point in Daniel to know that. Long before I knew about this tie and the metering of Daniel, I had been exposed to where else in Daniel this was going to apply. And the place where it applies in the other part of Daniel is now showing on screen in Daniel 11. Okay, it's Daniel 11, starting at Daniel 11, 6 through 17. This roughly covers the period from what's called the Battle of Ipsus to, it's really important in history, and it's really important that Mary reference it. The Battle of Ipsus until the marriage with Bernike, down here in verse 17. Both, this is a whole paragraph about, well, you have to start in verse 6. This is all about the machinations of the Greeks, known to history as the Diadochi, or Diadochi, probably. So from Daniel, I can't, well, let's see, let me try and get it on the screen. God, I am so stupid. All right. This whole section covers a period in history from about 301 B.C. to 250 B.C. Be sure you got those dates because they're key to what Mary's doing. And it's really, it's, you know, everything about the Bible is ironic underneath the text. You have to know history. You have to know culture. You have to know semantic range of words to get it. And because we don't study these things, the Bible is, you know, confusing to us. And if our parents and our parents' parents and our parents' 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 parents 
had all studied this stuff like Mary did, we wouldn't have a confusion. All right, but we do, so we go from where we are. Anyway, what you see highlighted in blue on screen is the key to Mary's meter. And I learned it, and I'm going to put um, links in the sidebar in the video description. I learned it when my pastor exegeted Daniel 11. He went through the history that you see highlighted in blue. That's how come I understood it. But I didn't associate it with Mary until tonight. Okay. Um, it's March 15th now. You're not going to see this video for some months. Anyway, the point is that this is where she's drawing her meter. All right. It covers 301 B.C., the aftermath, really, 299 to be specific. Very specific times. 299 B.C. to 249 B.C. Okay, because there were two important marriages blocking that time period, which were between this, the, a guy named Seleucus, who used to be under Ptolemy, he split from Ptolemy, and they started fighting with each other. It's a long story. Just look up the Battle of Ipsus and start studying up on Seleucus and Ptolemy. All of that was presaged by Daniel in Daniel 11. Okay, and I'm going to make a quick sidebar about the stupidity of people who claim that Daniel is written late. Because even the Greek translation of Daniel predates Hanukkah by over a hundred years. And actually, Daniel 11 is about the evil of the Maccabees. So, I'm sure that the Maccabees messed with the text. And that's where the stupid scholars who don't study very much get the dumb idea that Daniel is a late book. Because the Maccabees probably tried to destroy it they probably saw themselves mirrored in it because Daniel 11 is about the Jewish Antichrist and the Greek Antichrist in the near context and then in the far context what becomes the king of the west because the king of the north is successively in the historically moving westward to Rome all right and the ultimate Armageddon problem that we're all going to see happens as a result of a Jewish Antichrist playing the role of a Maccabee, uniting himself with the King of the West. We call it West now. The Bible call, still calls it King of the North. Ultimately, that alliance will repeat itself. And we got all the history to know exactly what's going to happen. And that's what Mary's doing. She's linking it up. You can't miss that she's talking about Hanukkah. You just can't miss it if you know your history and if you know your meter. All right? So hopefully you've had a chance to read that text that's on screen, or you can go read it at your leisure or pause the video to read it, and then look in the video description where I mapped these verses to specific historical periods when I you know, was listening to my pastor exegete the whole chapter. And um, if you want, um, there's a link also in the video description pointing you to where you can get the lessons yourself in Hiram, where he exegetes the Hebrew, okay? Because, you know, this is in Hebrew. It starts in Hebrew again in Daniel 9. Hebrew was a dead language in the time of the Maccabees. Daniel is not a late book, okay? End of story. And to help you see that even more, we're going to go back now to Mary. Okay, upper right hand corner, pink. The description that I'm going to say in the video is all in writing too, in the Magnificat meter piece, you know, right here. It's in writing. If, if the video is too much for you, just read it because I wrote it out as well. I make the videos because it helps me. I don't know if it helps anybody else. Okay, so here you go. In the upper left hand corner, yellow. Magnificat meter draft 2 is going to have what I'm saying in the video in writing. For me, that's easier. For you, it might be easier to hear it. Okay. 
first meaning, the most important thing about these Bible Hebrew meter poems is the date line. Because if you can't prove the date line, then either your math is wrong, because the whole interpretation is going to hang on the date line. The date line tells you like a little theme about what the whole time poem is about. Okay, like when Moses wrote Psalm 90, his first his first divisible by seven paragraph was 63 syllables, which means it was 63 sevens, okay, from the time that Israel went into slavery. That's a complicated calculation I go through in the Psalm 90 and 11 GGS videos. And it's also 10, in the 1051st year after the flood. So he's linking up the slavery and the flood together, which is exactly what the theme of his poem is about. Same thing here with Mary. 35. I've already said this before, but I'm going to say it again. There are two ways you have to do this. You have to use your dateline as a strict number, okay, going backwards in time. You have to, it's a triangulation of dates, so there's no mistaking when the thing is written, okay. You, you're allowed, you, the, the, style that's employed that I've seen is like here it's a number of sevens. It's got to be a number of sevens. But that could be 35 times seven, which it is, or it could be straight 35 years because 35 itself is a number of sevens. And that's what Moses and Isaiah and Daniel had done. That's what Mary's doing and of course that's what Paul ends up doing too. So you are to read this as and test it as 35, okay, which is, that's the footnote about 35, but the, the version you're going to see is more, up, more updated from what you see on screen now. Okay, so she's in late end of 5 BC, okay? I mean, we're going to call it that because that's our ADBC system. It might really be another proper ADBC date, but we're going to call it that because that's the system that most scholars use when they date things, especially Christian scholars. The Roman scholars have a slight variance. Okay, 35 years prior to the time she talks. That's the first most obvious meaning, just like Daniel down here is dating from 49 years prior to the time he talks. Okay. And make that bigger so you can see it. All right? Same idea, same style. All right? So 35 years prior to when Mary talks is 40 BC. That is probably when she was born because she ought to be dating in terms of her own age because she's royal. And that is, for sure, we know that's when Herod became Tetrarch. So years from a king is how you're supposed to do it or years from a significant event relative to Israel. Okay? That's the first date back. It's a date back function. It's a rule. Okay, 35 years, that's a no-brainer. All right? But there's another, and this is where it ties to Daniel 11. There is another way that this is often done, where you take 35 times 7 as your date back. Now, it's not required to do it that way, but it's common. So you, you look for it. And this is what was hanging me up. There's 35. Okay. You know, could they make it harder to read? And, okay, times 7. 245 years backwards from when she talks. Okay, if she's talking at the end of 5 BC, we're just going to add 5 you know, round it, you have to add a year forward or back. It could be 249, 250, 251. Okay. So we'll just say 250 in round terms. 250 in round terms is when this thing happens right here. A woman. Okay. That's the first thing. There's the, that's when that marriage thing happens. All right? And I want to say it's Philopater 
or um, Philadelphus. I think it's Philopater. The, the, the map in the um, video description will have the exact name because I, I don't want to waste too much time here. All right, that's the date she's referencing. She's referencing the prophecy. She, this is a book ending. See, the date she's talking is not only relative to her own birth here, this 35. It's not only relative to her own birth. We'll just, I'll, 39 is highlighted, but look to the right of it. 35 is not only relative to her own birth, backwards. Not only relative to Herod, backwards. But it's also relative, and most importantly, to showing that the fulfillment of Daniel 11.17 took place. And she's writing 245 years after that event. What she's doing, and hopefully you notice this, is this a verse about a marriage, a diplomatic marriage, and it's really between the Seleucids, the beginning, they're just starting out at this point, the Seleucids in 250 BC, 250, 249, 250 BC, and the Ptolemies. They, they alternately fight with each other, that's what this text is saying. They alternately fight with each other and make alliances through their women. And that is historical fact that this happened. In fact, it's so obviously historical fact that people try to dish, you know, to trash Daniel. They just don't believe the Bible can be accurate. I mean, the Bible just, it's persona non grata on both sides. If it's right, it has to be wrong. And if it's wrong, if it looks wrong, even looks wrong, because you're a bad scholar, then you say, well, see, it's all the Bible's fault. It's just a myth. Bible can't win for losing, all right? This historical fact, and it's so accurate to the history of what happened between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies that people want to dismiss Daniel. And Daniel's been, the book has been a political football among the Jews primarily because Daniel talks about how bad the Jews are, especially in this chapter. And the Maccabees are, are forecast in here. They were the guys who, who really brought on the problem of Hanukkah. I mean, they were, you know, I mean, they were the priesthood. And yeah, one of their number finally decided to fight. Okay, but then his sons just completely wrecked both the priesthood and the royal family of David afterwards. And that's exactly what Daniel's talking about, that pattern. Antichrists. Okay? So I don't wonder that the book of Daniel was fought over by the Jews. It was political football. They mashed up the text. The, the, there's some of the Greek text that's just unbelievable. But we have the Hebrew, and honey, they didn't speak Hebrew in the days of the Maccabees. All right? They were trying to recreate it, and they didn't quite know how. All right? So Mary is talking about the diplomatic marriage. Mary is a woman. See, Mary's a woman. Okay, so she's talking, see, of his female slave. So it's appropriate and witty that she date back her own dateline to women. Paul does the same thing in Ephesians. He dates his time to the severance and he makes funny jokes about pregnancy during the time of the severance in the syllables 231 to 238. It's hysterical. Okay, so this is about the women being involved. All right, so that's the paragraph that she's targeting. And the 42 is doing the same thing. The 42 is targeting the beginning of that same period. See, this is 250, 249, 250. And then 42 times 7 takes you to the beginning, which is about 299, when diplomatic marriages were taking place. Okay? And just look up those dates, and look up Seleucus, and look up Ptolemy. 249 B.C., 299 B.C. It took me a while to figure this out. I'm sorry. I'm so damn dumb. All right? That's the period she's referencing when she uses... The 42, because 42 
times 7 is 294. And again, if you add 5 years to that, she's talking 5 BC, you get 299. And that was, a fam that was a famous marriage in order to try and cement the Ptolemies and the Seleucids together so they wouldn't have to fight, just like Daniel forecast in Daniel 11, 7 through 17. That's what she's dating back to. So 35, her years, that's how old she is at the time. So she wasn't a youngster. Okay, she was closer to a spinster which means she was spending her time studying Bible and obviously she learned it because honey there's not a pastor alive who could do this this kind of meter okay of course people don't even know about the meter today okay but she did it on the fly as soon as she's told she's pregnant okay we're really stupid today in Christianity compared to this this person all right, so 35, that's how old she is, and obviously she spent her time studying Bible instead of getting married, you know. Doesn't say if she was pretty or not. Maybe she wasn't. I don't know. But whatever it was, she was a Bible geek. And if you're a Bible geek, you don't have time to get married. All right, 35. Or 35 times 7, which is 245 my you know plus five going backwards in time from when she talks that's 250 that's Daniel 11 17 okay 250 BC that Daniel 11 17 being depicted here at the end here that's the end point that she's referencing and she's referencing Daniel okay then the other part of it is 42 and I haven't told you what the straight 42 means yet I could kick myself, I swear. Okay, 42 times 7 is 294, plus 5 is 299 BC, and that's talking about this period. Actually, it's starting about here. Okay, because this is the Battle of Ipsus, just after the Battle of Ipsus, right here in verse 4. Okay. And like I said, you can you can get my pastor's exegesis to see it yourself. And you can check these dates. They're very famous dates. They're very famous events that you can find very easily on Google and any scholarly source you want. 299 to 249 BC, which is just after the Battle of Ipsus, which was a major, had a major impact on history. That's how the Diadochi the, the came about. All right? It's a long story and it's kind of too hard to tell in a video. That's the period she's referencing. Verses 4, really, which I can't cover. Verses 4 through 17. The end of it, verse 17, is, high, is referenced by her 42, okay, in this line, okay, and the 35 is referenced by Daniel 11, verses 4 through 7. Okay, now I haven't told you yet. That's backwards dating. I haven't even gotten to the forward dating criterion yet. The back, other backwards dating date line that she's using is 42. Again, let's take our calculator. We got 42 years plus the 5 when she's talking. That's 47. What happened then? Oh, golly, I am so dumb. That's when our boy Julius Caesar, having crossed the Rubicon and won the dictatorship in 48 BC, makes his triumphal tour through the Middle East to wipe out what remains of Pompey's army. Because remember, Pompey made the cataclysmic mistake. See, he rises to power, and then this is when he goes to the Middle East. Okay, and then he decides he wants to help out Caesar, who he then turns against. So Caesar crosses the Rubicon. Okay, well, the aftermath of this is that Caesar himself goes to the Middle East. That's when he meets up with Cleopatra and he has a son by her the whole bit. Okay, well, Caesar was very pro-Israel. And if you look at the 42, which corresponds to 47 B.C., Okay, 
um, when he was there, he passed certain laws and he made certain provisions that were very favorable to Israel so she could get back on her feet. It was really, it was the best thing that could have happened to her was Julius Caesar. It really was. Okay? So, I, 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 let me just finish this part of it. So, the, the biggest, most important thing you have to do with the time poem is establish its state line backwards. And they usually, but not always, do a straightforward, see here's the number, you just count 35 years backwards. But the other way they do it, and she's doing it also, is you count it by number of sevens. Daniel didn't do it that way. Daniel did a straightforward 49, counting backwards from the time the temple went down, because that was so famous and obvious. But he did do 73 sevens here in order to tag back to Moses. So Mary, instead of doing two different lines um, with, see, because this isn't divisible by seven, that's what threw me for a while. Mary's doing two lines the same way Daniel is, but she's doing it with two lines divisible by seven to highlight the importance to Israel's history. All right? 35 backwards takes you to 40 BC, obvious. Her birthday, I'm, I'm a, I would bet money and Herod being Tetrarch, all right? Then also 35 sevens, which takes you back to 250 BC, and that's Daniel 11, 17, the diplomatic marriage, all right? And then um, the second way she's doing it, is she's counting backwards 42 years, and that takes you to when Caesar was touring the Middle East and, and the Jews got a substantial amount of freedom from him as a result of him taking over. In contrast to Pompey, who just wanted to, you know, he was anti-Israel, but Caesar was pro. Okay? So 42 plus 5 is 47. That's when Caesar was making his tour. And it, interesting thing enough, and I keep, you know, it's so wry the way Luke, the Lucan syllables add to this. The year was 46 BC when he made the actual uh, provisions for the Jews. But it started in 47, 47, 46, give or take a, a year. Because remember, she's talking at the end of 5 BC. So I have to ask myself why Luke is doing this. It's, it's like a little wry commentary that's wrapping around Matt, Mary. But that could just be a coincidence. So 42 plus 5 is 47. That's when Caesar was making his tour of the Middle East after having crossed the Rubicon. Okay? See? After this. It's the aftermath of this. Okay, that's backwards. And then 42 times 7 is 294 plus 5, which takes you just in the aftermath of the Battle of Ipsus, which is when they do their first diplomatic marriage. Okay? And that's 299 B.C. And you can go look it up on the Internet. That's Seleucus and Ptolemy. Just look on those names and those dates and you'll find it. Okay, so we have established the backwards dating, both of which are relative to Hanukkah because it's due to the, so the, Seleucids, and the, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies that Hanukkah occurs with the Jews trying to play both of them against each other. And, and actually being corrupted by both sides. This is how come the Maccabees screwed up. Is they, they, they first fought against Antiochus, who's a Seleucid descendant, because it was Antiochus who desecrated the temple. But then just after that, they made nice with the, with the Ptolemies and with the descendants of, of Antiochus IV. And actually, um, Jonathan who was um, the brother of Judas Maccabeus, the son of Mattathias. He's the guy who got bribed and stole the priesthood. And, was, and according, I think the guy was Demetrius, or Demetrius bribed him and said that he could wear the purple so he has usurped the kingship. That's just after Hanukkah. All right? So the Maccabees are the, the Daniel 11 Jewish traitors. Okay? So no wonder Daniel, the book of Daniel's political football during that period. I, you know, we predicted badly against them. Okay? So we know that she's talking about Hanukkah. She's talking about the historical events 
that led up to it, and she's tying right straight back to Daniel, and Daniel is what? The prophet of Hanukkah. It, it can't be interpreted another way. You can't, If you know the meter, you can't miss that she's talking about Hanukkah, even if you didn't know Haggai too, even if you didn't know she was quoting it in her actual text. All right, now, the next thing that I have to still keep talking about, about this dateline, is that if you're going to pick a dateline, whatever this dateline is that you pick, just like Daniel did down here, and like Isaiah did, and Psalm 90 did, is from whatever dateline you're picking, you have to go full circle from the past to your present to bookend that dateline. See, here's where Daniel does it. He starts with his dateline. That's his second dateline, tying back to Moses. He comes full circle here. He operates on two time tracks in order to do it because he's linking the juridical cause between Solomon and Manasseh. And then he's coming full circle here, making sure you know that by the 49. Okay, that's his other 49. Okay, my computer's starting to slow. Okay. And then he keeps on going full circle in his time track 1. Okay, and here's where he does it. That's his own capture. All right, and he's using that because he's now in his 70th year of captivity. And that's, you know, a, a play on, you know, the 70 years that Israel will be out and him making his prayer at that time. All right, because see, in 538, he's in his 70th year of captivity when he prays. Full circle to this, the date he prays. You see that? Okay, so the full circle requirement, therefore, Mary has to meet. Well, here's where she meets it. Let's go, let's do her now, full circle. Okay, we got 60, we got 35 in this line here. All right, where does she hit full circle with the 35? Right here. He puts to flight those of haughty Maine. Yeah, see? This was a defeat of somebody haughty, okay? And so is this. So see, she's paralleling. You got that? And of course, see if you took up if you took twenty-eight, and this paragraph alone is seven, okay? See, that's a seven. So seven and twenty-eight. Can I make this bigger? Seven, you see the 28? That's 28. So this paragraph here is 28, ending at 133, pregnantly, because 133 is extremely important in time poems. Okay, that's 28 syllable paragraph, plus this one, which is seven. All right, so all of this adds up to what? 35. So she's come full circle. She's come full circle here to her own age, and it's at 35 syllables, just like it was up here. You can't miss it. It's bookended, just like Daniel did. All right? And then your second bookend, Caesar being elected consul. All right? Remember, 42 years prior to 5 BC, Caesar was actually in Israel. Okay? And... So now, book ending here, and book ending here, all right, and book ending here. She's book ending to him in a number of places. So she comes full circle to 40, 47 BC right in here. I mean, you know, this is, this is the actual time, the first part of it, but then you got the aftermath. In other words, 40 BC happens because 49 BC happened. So she's gone full circle and explained the relationship of her own 40 BC circle in light of this. See, the 42 comes after, but it ropes and causes, see, it's bookended in here, conceptually and time-wise. All right, and maybe that's why Luke makes it become a seven here. I have to think about that. So now let's look at the text tie. 
The humiliation of Israel when Caesar came in in 47 BC had been horrible because they suffered a lot under um, Anthony and Cleopatra and under Pompey. I mean, that's why Herod got in power. All right. So when Caesar comes in, he leaves Herod in power. Or, yeah, Herod didn't get into power yet, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, because Anthony outlived him. That this is before Anthony, I'm sorry. The, the humiliation under Pompey had been great, because Pompey was the guy who wanted to, you know, take stuff out of the temple and all that. He was dissuaded at the last minute. Julius Caesar, of course, relented and was really good at the Jews on that count. All right. So that's 47 BC. All right, that's down here. So we got the humiliation of this female slave. Okay, this whole paragraph, starting with the humiliation and ending by his arm, he exerts authority. And that's when he passed the laws. And by the way, he's the guy that put in place the tax law that the Romans don't collect taxes from Jerusalem, but the locals do it. In other words, he won't find a Roman census in 4 BC. The, the Jews had to do it. Herod was the guy who actually collected the taxes. But anyway, I digress again. All right, so the humiliation of his female slave, all generations call me blessed. Here's the accomplishment of the almighty things. I mean, just start reading it as if you were reading it from 47 BC, full circle to the, the time when she comes back to Caesar. All right? And this could all just be a praise of how God delivered them through Caesar. This is the kind of sophistication these time poems have. Look how much it does for the interpretation and to know the timeline of the Bible that everybody debates because they don't know the meter. Isn't this awesome? All right. So her own timeline comes full circle. That's the requirement of time poem right here. And it's due to the second date line, which is datelining Caesar, okay, near term, all right, there. And then, of course, the far term relationship goes back and explains Hanukkah, which is the battle between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies that Daniel 11 had already explained. See, Daniel 11 is explaining how Daniel 7 and 8 get done specifically Daniel 8, 13 and 14. Why is it that there's going to be some Greek guy dominating the region? How are you going to know in advance when it takes place? Because you've got 2,300 days to count. And the Maccabees actually did know that because they dated the same way Daniel did to show you what it is. All right, or whoever wrote one Maccabees. It's not the same guy is the one who wrote two Maccabees. Two Maccabees is weird. But one Maccabees, it's almost like two Maccabees was written to compete with one Maccabees. I'm not really sure. I'd have to investigate it more. But Mary's dateline is going backward farther in time to show the cause of Hanukkah and therefore the cause of a Caesar. See, she's relating cause, all right, between one group who wanted to desecrate the temple, namely Antiochus and the Seleucids and periodically, and then um, Pompey versus Caesar because Israel is to apostate, so God hires somebody outside Israel to deliver her, okay? And then she comes full circle just to make sure you recognize the causal connection by means of the meter to her own age here in Herod. That's why Herod's in power. And then to Caesar, starting here. All right? And then she goes forward in time after that, which I've already covered in the previous videos. Now, what I haven't yet covered are two other things. Remember I said in the last, the last section of this video, that the 217 is going to have to add, okay, that's not the section you should be looking at yet, it's going to be revised. Okay, the 217 is going to have to add the same two numbers. What happens if you add 42 to 217 
And what happens if you add 35 to 217? And what happens if you do that multiplying by 7s? And that, my dear, is going to be in the document. It's too complicated to explain. And then the next thing that she does, which is also a requirement of time poems, is that 35 times 7 has to be referencing a period forward in the future. See, it's a triangulation. It's like, it's like a chronology GPS. You can't not know when she wrote because she has to provide dates backward and forward. Time 7, remote past. And, you know, based on the, the, the number, 35. See, this is recent past. 35 in the past, 42 in the past. Okay, well then this, this ends in the future. So now she's got to add the 217. It's got to reference a date in the future all by itself. And then she's got to add 35 to it to show another date in the future. And then she's got to add 42 to the same 217 to reference another date in the future. And then... She's got to do the 217 plus the 35 times 7, and the 217 plus the 42 times 7, which also dates from the future backwards. And all of that is designed to give you a good, precise, doctrinal understanding of the text. So you know exactly what she means by what she says. And that, my dear, is so complicated that I would bid, you know, I would beg you to read about it in the footnotes. See where the 35 is? You got an A footnote, which the text you're seeing on screen now is not the way it's going to be. And in, in 217, you got another footnote. And I'm going to have updated text in there explaining what is it with all these numbers. And what's the point of all this? So you know what she means by what she says. Because, honey, there's, if you just look at this text, Oh, my soul magnifies the Lord. You think that's all it means. Uh-uh. She's doing a complete historical review of history, backwards and forwards to the millennium, just like every other time poem does that looks like it doesn't mean anything on the surface, like Psalm 90, Isaiah 53, Daniel 9, in Ephesians 1. They mean a whole lot more than what we're giving them credit for. And we would understand our Bibles better and we could prove our Bible dates better. And we wouldn't be so susceptible to the idiots who make all these arguments against the Bible if we just learned the meter, if we learned to count syllables. And commercial message. Mm -hmm.